This will be a very mini lecture, people. Okay. Just a few minutes on your way to other things. I wonder if I can set this. Do many of you have the copy of the Shakespeare poems there? I can get them and hand them up. Uh, yeah, that would be absolutely <coughs> fine. And let me begin with a few personal comments. I don't usually comment about myself when I begin to lecture. The material is the point, and you folk are the point, and not I. But a few comments here might help. You saw that I do courses on the Bible, and I headed the program on the studies in religion at the University of Michigan. One of the major issues in religious studies is what frequently goes under the name of the, the problem of evil. How, given certain premises about a good God, can one explain, confront history? And so far, I've come to the conclusion that there is no adequate answer to, to that question. I've, I've studied all that I've seen, and I rather think, and we could talk about this to a considerable extent, that evil is not, in fact, a problem to be solved. The difficulty with it is that people who think they have identified evil soon discover that they think it exists in, in certain people. And they can't get at evil in the abstract. So they think they need to kill the people whom they see as embodiments of evil or, or carriers of evil. And we've had, not only in the last century, but in this one and in all the previous ones, altogether too much history of that. We could talk about that in, in terms of the Bible and on. But... Perhaps, as I'll suggest, it's, it's better to treat it as an issue to be managed. And we can manage it better or worse, and, and worse perhaps when we think we've identified evil and try to get at it by killing other people. One more personal matter, and then into Shakespeare. Eh? When I was a young lad, 20, I thought I knew a considerable deal. And I think the present Ralph Williams wouldn't much like the 20-year-old Ralph Williams. I was a right prig. <laughs> I thought I knew how the world should run and how people ought to think. And I thought at that point that to be a person from 20 years old on of unwavering, unchanging principle was the best thing that a human could be. <laughs> I don't think so now. Since I've been age 20, my principles have changed. I've jettisoned many of them rather eagerly. I hope in favor of ones that are more open, more tolerant, more accepting, more likely to rejoice at the diversity of the way in which humans work out their good. Yeah. But there's one thing which hasn't changed since then. I won't willingly let beauty die. Beauty doesn't solve the problem of evil. But with beauty fostered and appreciated, you can face it and perhaps face it down and find much to love in this world. Yeah. Elaine Scarry <coughs> said there are two features of what happens when we're in the presence of beauty. One of them is that you want to point it out to other people. You go to them and you say, do you notice that? Isn't that lovely? Isn't it beautiful? Do you see these features? Do you know what I mean? This is true, isn't it? When you see something beautiful, the other is you don't want it ever to die. Okay? And Shakespeare, in his sonnets particularly, takes up these issues. 
And the issue is very deep for him because like many other great artists, Michelangelo among them, he was passionate about beauty. But he also realized we're creatures of time. <laughs> and beauty is vulnerable to time. And the sonnets are in many ways Shakespeare's way of confronting these issues. And for Shakespeare, <laughs> he lived in a world in which beauty was short-lived in us humans. The average life extent was about 30. Right. So that those of you who are young and in your teens or 20s, let's say you're 20, you would have had two-thirds of your time and a rather short time. On average, the life extent was cut down on average by high infant mortality. But Shakespeare you know, was writing sonnets presumably into his 40s. Okay? And he already thought himself as an old man by that point. And they didn't have our medicine. Yeah. And they didn't have our dentistry. Any dentists here? <laughs> yes, there you are. <laughs> All right. And so beauty was, was very passing, very fragile. And in Shakespeare, again and again, you find as in As You Like It, anybody know the play or will willing to know the play? <laughs> There's a hymn at the end of it. To Hymen, God of every town. In Shakespeare's time, you see, the danger was not of overpopulation. The danger was that the town would die out through plague, through war. And if young people didn't engage in the dance of love, <laughs> the town would die out. And so the Roman god, Hymen, eh? Hymen, the physiological place where the genders and generations meet, is celebrated as the god of every town, right? because the town is thus perpetuated. But Shakespeare does something very strange, unique virtually. He begins his sonnets. One critic called them the greatest poem in English, and in aggregate they arguably are. He begins the sonnets as voiced by a male poet, deeply in love, with a younger male. And he urges them in the first 15, 17 sonnets, go get Mary, Mary, and preserve beauty in the world. Pass it on. You're beautiful. I'm in love with your beauty. Get married. Make the world more beautiful. And then, in the sonnets, there's a development of that relationship. And then, toward the end of the sonnets, poems to the dark lady. One of the things about Shakespeare, one of the things which makes him the, perhaps the greatest of all world poets, is what I'll call the depth of his moral imagination. I'm born Canadian, I mentioned that, didn't I? And we're, we're born with little bow ties on, you know? <laughs> Our mothers complain about it, and it's distinctly uncomfortable, they tell us, but, but we are. And we're taught to keep within us much of what we are, to wear the outward robes of our respectability around us and never, never, never let anybody see very deeply inside who we are. Shakespeare, as perhaps the greatest of all artists, incomparably lets us into the depth of his moral imagination. To refer to the plays for a moment, he can imagine a Cordelia in Lear, who, abused by her father, yet saves her father, tries to and dies in the attempt. Right? He can imagine a Desdemona, who is killed by her husband and dying, tells a lie of love. So, who has done this, says her maid Amelia, said, no one, I myself, commend me to my kind Lord. And I think all of us might want to say that we can imagine and show the world that we can imagine goodness like that. But a Iago, 
a Yago who destroys, destroys, destroys. And why? We could talk about that. Or a Richard III, a vortex of evil, who loves when he has ordered that someone be killed to be told about it at or after dinner. Ugh. And who wants to hear after dinner about the death of his two young nephews whom he's ordered killed, one of whom is named after him. And the voice of Richard is pitch perfect. How many of us would be willing to admit that we have a moral imagination which can do a sociopath with absolute bell-like perfection? Shakespeare will. And he presents to his people a whole world of people whom we recognize. Right? And in the sonnets, then, Shakespeare explores the, our responses to beauty. And take out those sheets, if you will. One of them, and we'll go to sonnet 129. One of them exploring in a beautifully crafted poem the tensions of our own sexual desires. Now, to understand this poem, it's not difficult, but you need to know one thing. In antiquity, in antique medicine, Galen, for example, any doctors here, we were born with a certain amount of what they called radical spirit. Right? Now, I'm Canadian, as I mentioned. They don't tell us about sex until we're 50, and then they tell us it's too late. All right? So I get embarrassed when I talk about these things, but I need to say it. Okay? Radical moisture, or spirit, was most condensed in the sexual fluids. Now, you see the... And when this radical moisture was exhausted, you were done, you were gone, you were dead. So you see the implications of this immediately. Right? You don't want to use it up too quickly. <laughs> right? On the other hand, when you died, you might not want too much let go. Right? <laughs> so you needed to be prudent about all of this and to expend it in appropriately watchful ways. So the expense of spirit. Now, Lift your eyes from the page for a moment. If I say to you, waste, which is one of Shakespeare's great words, how are you going to spell it? What are the two ways which might occur to you? Waste. W-A-S-T-E and W-A-I-S-T. And now you'll understand, I think, the poem. One other thing, though. In medieval and Renaissance language, the lower parts of the body particularly the vagina in a woman, were referred to as the lower part, the inferno, the lower part, which is also hell. <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right? There's a story in Boccaccio and the Decameron about a monk who doesn't have a calling, really, and he convinces a young woman whom he desires that he has a raging devil, which she could help him by allowing him to put it in hell. <laughs> in any case, here is Shakespeare's sonnet about our experience of sexual desire. The expense of spirit in a waste of shame is lust in action. And till action, lust is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame. Savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust. Enjoyed no sooner, but despise it straight. Past reason hunted, and no sooner had past reason hated. As a swallowed bait, on purpose laid, to make the taker mad. Mad in pursuit, and in possession so. Had, having, and in quest to have, extreme. A bliss in proof and proved a very woe before a joy proposed behind a dream. All this the world well knows, yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men 
to this hell? <laughs> Complex, isn't it? Complex. And he catches, he catches as with a bee in amber, in the beauty of those stanzas, something of the tense complexity that we are. I'll have time for only one or two more, but come back to Michigan and study them all with me. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a look at number 12, which is one of the sonnets urging the beloved young man to marry. Watches, clocks, were a fairly new invention in Shakespeare's time, and listen to the rhythm of the first line. When I do count the clock, that tells the time. Do you hear it? Tick tock. Time, the stuff of our lives. When I do count the clock that tells the time and see the brave day sunk in hideous night. Oh, I need to pause a moment. The word brave, <clears throat> it means courageous, often in Shakespeare, but it's also a word for color. All right? And here I am. Nothing about me is brave. But look at the orange here. And there's more orange there. There's a purple there. What is this orange you have on up there? You see, that's a brave color. Okay? And it's slashed against the darkness of our lives and, and makes our lives vibrant and lovely, you see. And so when I do count the clock that tells the time and see the brave day sunk in hideous night, when I behold the violet past prime, and sable curls all silvered o'er with white, when lofty trees I see barren of leaves, which erst from heat did canopy the herd, and summer's green all girded up in sheaves, born on the beer with white and bristly beard. And you're hearing it now. Like those sheaves carried in autumn, suddenly it becomes a beer, where like the tops of the grain, the white hairs are carried to the threshing. Then of thy beauty do I question make, that thou amongst the wastes of time must go. There's the terror of that word waste in Shakespeare. It's a terrible word, waste, isn't it? The time will throw away that beauty and those beautiful people that we love with an uncaringness, with the mechanical tick-tock of a clock, and away it goes. Since sweets and beauties do themselves forsake and die as fast as they see others grow, and nothing against time's scythe can make defense save breed to brave him when he takes thee, hence. And the next generation then becomes the color, you see, that we slash in the face of time and death and say, take that. <laughs> and we leave beauty behind us in the world, if we will. But these are the words of a male poet to a young man that he loves. Sonnet 15. When I consider everything that grows, holds in perfection but a little moment, that this huge stage presenteth not but shows, where on the stars in secret influence comment, we're all on stage. All the world's a stage, you know that one. And the stars are up there saying, oh, well done. You played that part beautifully. Ah, uh, you kind of muffed your lines on that one. Well, all right, perhaps tomorrow night's performance, but you best get it straight before the run's over. When I perceive that men as plants increase, cheered and checked, even by the self-same sky, vaunt in their youthful sap, at height decrease, and wear their brave state, out of memory. That line might use a little glossing. Think, if you will, of some young people, young couple putting on a party. And they invite mom and dad to it, largely young people. And 
mom and dad come in, and the young people go, oh. And the daughter says, mom, why did you have to wear that? Well, what's wrong with that? I bought it at Neiman Marcus in 1982. <laughs> I haven't worn it much. It's still good. That is wearing your brave state out of memory. <laughs> okay. All right. But then the conceit of this inconstant stay set you, most rich in youth, before my sight, where wasteful time debateth with decay to change your day of youth to sullen night, and all in war with time, for love of you, as he takes from you, I engraft you new. To, does anybody do gardening, horticulture? To graft something is a term in horticulture it's deeply sexual as well as the insertion of a stock in and taking its growth from and nourishment from another root, if you will. But it's also based in the Greek word graphane, as in graphic arts and to write. And what Shakespeare is saying here is that I have no way to preserve your beauty for future generations but to try to write it out, to represent it in art. And the irony is that where brass and stone, marble, crumble, those words carried on the labile medium of air go on from generation to generation. And the image of that which is loved is put beyond the power of time to waste. And so, from me to you, take some time in whatever medium to create an image of the beauty that you love, of the person or the natural world. Somehow, engraft it new and carry it on to future generations as an act of love. I'll simply read without large comment one more. Actually, I think we actually have to. We have to I'm leave. I'm so sorry. Is this for any of like, we had three... Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs>